Greetings, programs. Zach W. Lorton here uh, with another episode of the Backburner Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, today I have a guest with me. This is Jason Kelly. Jason Kelly is one of the heads of Manifested Mercy, a nonprofit organization. And I invited him to be on this podcast today because we have a top 10 list that uh, he actually brought the idea to me. It's not the most unique because I've seen a top 10 list like this before, but you have a pretty unique perspective on it. This, these are the top, I'm, I'm calling it the top 10 games that stretch your mind, that make you think that make you think of specifically focus on certain things. So why don't you talk a little bit about why you thought about it. The reason this is important to me, first of all, Manifested Mercy, just so you know, uh, we work with people that are basically trying to get second chances in life. Best way to explain it, uh, people getting out of incarceration or people dealing with addictions. One of the main things that people deal with is that there's a thinking error issue going on, and we try to fill and block, we help them block through programming, things such as thinking errors, um, triggers, and urges. And one way to do that is to keep yourself busy, and keeping our mind busy is huge, because any of us battling addictions or that have had criminal issues in the past find it really easy to slip back into that thought process. Yeah. As a gamer myself, I love games that make me think, especially if I'm battling anything that, that's a hard part, you know, a hard issue, depression or other stuff. And so this is important to me because I love to sit and really think through moves. I, I think of it like a chess player. Chess masters have 10 moves ahead, whatever their number is. And it's that process that I'm trying to think as I'm watching other people play around the board and then what I'm going to do. So that's kind of why this is an important list for me and why um, I, I kind of broke that down that way. So we decided to put our, together our own top 10 lists. So you're going to hear 20 titles today. Um, and we're going to give you those in our own order. And now for me, I, when I put mine together, I ranked it. My number one is like my favorite out of the ones that, that kind of make me think in this vein. You know, not the ones that necessarily bring about analysis paralysis right or anything like that what about what how did you rank yours so by the way my wife and now alice analysis analysis paralysis <laughs> Big yeah time. she's got it every time you Big played with time. her how long does it take her to play king of tokyo i don't know <laughs> uh two things that i put in my criteria the first one is most of these are in order of my favorite games okay. uh, from favorite to least favorite uh Understand that there's a little bit of mixture there, just because when I, I broke it down to the thinking process, some jumped on my list. Um, the second thing is I tried to do a good job of representing different game types in my top ten, and I will explain each of those, and, and that way, it, you know, some people like certain types of games better than others, and this will give some ideas and options for people to play. Yeah. Most of these are easily and readily available. Let's dive into this, shall we? Number ten. And number 10 uh, is a game that I think a lot of people might balk at this and say, really, is this, does this make you think? And yeah, it kind of does, but it makes you think. In, it makes you think? It makes you think. It makes you think in a way that is very specific because you have to be thinking about the other people at the table. And that game is Codenames from Czech Games Edition. I really, really, really enjoy word games. I always have. This reminds me of the old Password game. You remember Password? Yeah. 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 If you don't know how to play this game, I would suggest checking out another video that teaches you how to play this game because I'm not going to go into it. But the idea is that you're trying to basically do word association with multiple cards at the same time in a way that gets people to guess what word you're thinking of without making sure that they guess the wrong word. Well, because you've got things that they can get and can't get because you've got certain spots you're supposed to avoid at all costs. So you have to think right. through that. And I, I find this game is, is really good for um, about four to six players, okay. personally. I, I don't like it at a lower number, and I'm definitely not uh, real fancy when, when there are too many people because I feel like then it gets too much of everybody right. thinking different right. stuff that can really get you off edge and there's no way to take it back at that point. They're going to flip a card and then, oh, there's the assassin or whatever the case may be. So. I, I got to be honest with you. I tried playing this game once uh, with an odd number of people. And nobody else knew how to play the game except for me. So I played the Spy Master for two teams of even numbers. That didn't work. No. <laughs> that didn't work at all. I couldn't keep them straight. In order to, to really hone in on what you think the people at your table are going to understand what you're trying to say, it's a tough one. And uh, it, it really does make you think in a different way than you would normally think. So that's why Codenames is my number 10. All right, so my number 10 is actually going to be the one game on this list that I've only played once. Uh, I got a chance just to play this game a few weeks ago, and the more I thought about it, I said, yeah, this has got to go on my list for thinking games because I really enjoyed it. It is not easy to get because it's a small company that kickstarted, and they're not making it available at stores locally. So I'm apologizing in advance because this one is not as easy. It's a game called Mystia, M-Y-S-T-H-E-A. 
Uh, Mystia is a engine building area control game. Basically, it is this world that moves around and you're trying to do get your men placed on there, but you have to hand management. You've got a deck of cards and based upon how you play them, it, it moves it out. And there is some real thinking into this because there's different ways to play cards once or over um, different realms. I, I wish I could explain this better because I've only played it once. The mixture of area control and hand management and engine building because again as you get certain cards that you play that stay out you're building an engine that can you know help you with a little bit of fighting i'm nodding my head like i know what you're talking about but i've never played the game <laughs> i just played it a couple weeks ago really no. enjoyed it one of my favorite engine builders is wingspan but frankly i don't consider it one that you have to have a lot of thought to play and therefore i couldn't put it on my list i love wingspan but it's not necessarily one that you have to think a lot about it's wingspan is weird it's it's hard to it's hard to, to nail that one down to a, a specific mechanic because, yes, there is engine building in there. There's a whole lot more to yeah, it. And management and yeah. worker placement. I mean, there's there's so much to it. And I love the game. I but think it's... frustration is a mechanic in that game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't know where it'll fit on my overall top list, but it definitely was a thinker that had a nice area control feel to it. Uh, cool. It's got a fantasy kind of theme, so anyone that likes that, that'll fit in. You're playing golems, basically, with a hero. Very well put together game, too. They, uh, the pieces of figurines with them are nice. I mean, you could probably do it with basic little meeples, but this was a great... Great production of that one. So, yeah. Cool. So cool. that was my number 10, Mystia. For those of you that are interested, Mystia is available on uh, Magic Madhouse. Nice. For $98 plus 41 shipping. It is not It is not an inexpensive game. Number nine. My number nine game is one that many gamers are already going to know. You just got this in the mail. Yes, I did. <laughs> I have something to go with this. So my number nine is Carcassonne. Tile laying. Tile. 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 Tile, tile laying game. However... Um, my caveat for this is the thinking part comes when you use the farmer expansion. Yes, yes. Um, because basic Carcassonne, you're placing your meeples down to get cities and roads. That's basic Carcassonne. It's real easy. I'm, I don't doubt that or argue that. We play it a lot at my house. It's a favorite game that's quick and easy. And we use the river expansion and we've got the cathedral. So we've got a lot that we use. So there's a process. The way the farmer expansion works is you lay them down on their side. The attempt is to get as many completed cities in the field. And you get three points for every completed city that touches the field that you control. Man, you don't know at the beginning if that field's going to be big, if there are going to be cities on it. <laughs> exactly. And so sometimes you're being quick to throw them down because you want to get ahead of everybody else. That's where the thought comes in because it can be a huge point gain if you play it right during the game. And those fields can be cut off by roads, yep. by the cities uh, themselves, by the rivers and, and other things like yep. that. So I have played this a lot on the digital app and I love it. <clears throat> it uses the farmer, and I think the river comes with, with the app, and you can purchase other expansions yep. and whatnot. Yep. But, man, it's it's a lot of fun to play, and it plays seamlessly if you want to play multiplayer with other people. We use all the expansions we've got, but there are so many expansions in this game. You could be buying yeah. this and Dominion or the most, like, oh, my gosh, expansions. Yeah. So I've, I've seen a mega game of Carcassonne get played at a convention before. I think they used every expansion that was available. Played one giant game of it. I'd love to do it, but I will never attempt to get those yeah. in my home. It's, it's just, a it's a great game. Yeah, love yeah. it. So, yep, my number nine, Carcassonne. My number nine is one that I had not played at all until once last year. It is a straight up Euro, but for whatever reason, this one had enough interesting things in it that kept me going. Uh, the game is Hansa Teutonica. I hope I'm pronouncing that one correctly. This is a really interesting Euro game where you are basically trying to connect cities. I, I can't remember theme-wise if you're merchants. With Euros, the theme doesn't really matter all that much. But one of the things that I thought was really interesting was that you had to have different resources in order to claim different types of locations. And they used different shapes of wooden cubes, maybe a disc or maybe a square, uh, in order to, to place that down. And each one required a different type of resource. It allowed for a bunch of different ways that you could earn victory points. And it was a challenge because it was the lead was always going back and forth, back and forth throughout the game. So uh, the one time I played it, I, I was really impressed by it. Among Euro fans, it's a fairly popular... I'm sure several of you who are into Euros who are watching this podcast, Hansa Tutaraka, yes, I've, I know that one. I've played that one. I have a copy. Hey, would you like my copy? Zach, would you like my copy? <laughs> and if you are thinking that, the answer is, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. If, you like, if you like the Euro, this is a Euro that is a little bit unique. It's not just simply cube pushing. I, I think you'd probably... I think you'd probably get a kick out of it. Cool. May not be one of your favorites, but... I've always been up to playing just about any game. There are very few I'll say no to. Cool. So that's my number nine, Hansa Tutanaka. Number eight. 
I had a really hard time picking my number eight spot. I was going back and forth between two games by the same designer, and that designer is Brian Surrey. He's a guy who's local to us. He's yep. He attends the same board game night that we attend on occasion. And I was going back and forth between his first design and one of his most recent designs, and I decided for this particular list, it had to be Winterborn. This box is not very big at all, and it only retails for like $39, but holy crap, what a great, what a great, whew. you're combining a rondelle mechanic, you're combining deck building, you're combining res, uh, resource management. It's it's so complicated to try to explain that the first few times I played this, I had to reread the rules. Yes. Once you get it going, it's it's almost, it almost has a feel like an engine builder too. You've played this before, yeah? Yeah, I played it with Brian. The one time I played, I, I, I used to own the game. However, it wasn't getting played at my house. And okay. since so many in our gaming group had it, but I, I liked the game. Um, I was blessed with playing it for the first time with Brian. That's the only caveat I have against it is it's not easy to learn. In other words, sure. it it is it is a intense learning curve for the big, first time you play because of how yeah. the rules and how it all works going around. And it's not for beginners. No, at all. in a way, it's kind of like a multiplayer solitaire because each player has their own rondel board. Yep, you are controlling a shaman, a Viking, and an explorer. And each one, each time that you move one around the rondel, you are able to do a particular action. But each act, each each character that you move has a different action that you can take. So there's always an option. Even if you don't have the resources to be able to do one of the specialized abilities, you still can do other things. You can you can collect things without having to spend a whole lot. It's a lot of fun. It's a really, really fun game. Yeah. And there's some good cards in the game that allow you to have in-game points based upon how what you've accumulated as you're playing and stuff. So yes, it's, absolutely. It's, God, it's almost a point salad. It, it's almost... <laughs> the deck building, rondel, resource management, point salad, in a way. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of different ways yeah. you can do it. It's, it's fun. I find with Brian, by the way, just to, to exclaborate, <laughs> ex exclaborate? Expand? Ex uh, sure, expand. We'll go with that. It's an EX word. It'll work. Is that I find that his games, the further he's producing, are getting better every oh, time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I have found that every time I play one of his newer games, whether it's because he's playtesting them with us or the, the final version, I, I have liked everyone better as they've been coming out. Right. Um, so, yeah. Anyway. Winterborn came out um, before Freshwater Fly. Yes. And the, his most recent Kickstarter game was Merchants of the Dark Road, yeah. which also, fantastic game. Yeah. Love if, it. If you're looking at putting together, you know, like un, unraveling a puzzle, Brian's your designer. Yeah. So, Winterborn, my number eight. Um, just so you know, you all know, uh, if you're in gaming, you know. If you're not, you don't know. But uh, if you're into gaming, you know, roll and rights have become the big popular thing over the last two to three years. They are everywhere. Many of them are very simple. Cossy. However, there's one that makes me really think because it is not about the numbers. It is about, the, I mean, there's numbers for points, but it's about the Tetris feel of it and the fantasy feel of it because you're making a map and that is cartographers. Mm -hmm. Now, the caveat on this is I am a huge fan of anything in the role player world and cartographers fits in that theory. Big time. Yeah. So it's I, I'm a little biased for this. However, I find that every time I play it, I actually use colored pencils now to oh, designate yeah. every one of the different fields you're putting into this map. And you're basically trying to be the best map layer because everybody that plays can choose where they put the particular field or forest or river or whatever down. And it includes some encounters with monsters and you're putting those on other people's um not your own? That's the one thing I think makes this game that much better than most of the other roll and write or flip and write games that I've, I've seen is that there is other player interaction. Uh, it's not a big box. It's it's so big I didn't bring it with me today. But um, wonderfully well it's, done it's game. It's so big you didn't bring yeah. it with me. <laughs> it's, it's so big. It's so big. So um, it wouldn't fit in his truck. Yeah, I love it. It's a great game. It's quick. It's easy. I've never had a problem explaining it to people. Right. Yeah. And I'm thinking because it's Tetris, you're fitting these spaces on the board. Some cards give you more than one choice um, of either the terrain or the or the shape. But because it's quick, you can sometimes play a couple games at a time. So if I had to pick something to make me think, but I didn't have a lot of time, this is the one I'd go to because it's a shorter and smaller game, and uh, it is probably my favorite. I'd have to check, but I'm pretty sure it's my favorite. Roll and write. Flip and write, which is cartographers. So that is my number eight. It's a great experience too. Yeah. I mean, as as far as games like that go in that ilk, it's a really great experience. You're building a map. I mean, who would have thought that you could make a game where you're you're building a map? It's a game about building a map. I mean, it's not even what you do on the map. It's building, building a map. map. So 
you know, very much in the same way that role player is building a character. Exactly. Anyways, that's my number eight, cartographers. Number seven. So my number seven is I chose to go into the abstract uh, strategy uh, option for my number seven. Now, I had two things I was picking between because I love both of them and they get played a lot at my house with my son, a 15-year-old son who is quite the thinker. These type of games get played a lot. This is, I mentioned earlier, chess. It's a thinking game, but I... Uh, instead of chess, I thought about Onitama. I love Onitama, but it is not the one I chose. I chose to go with Santorini. Mm. Um, now, the reason I went for Santorini from for my uh, my abstract is because with the god powers, you get a card with a specific power. You can't just move your pieces and build pieces up because the object of the game is to be the first player at the third level. And you can cap these off to not let people get to them. But when you have a god power, sometimes you can't go up because if you move up, their power will activate. Right. Or... You have to do something for your power to activate, which can prevent them from something. So the, the god powers really make you think, I have lost so many times to my son yeah. because I make a move and I'm feeling really good. Oh, I'm two moves away from winning, except that his power allows him to do something and then I lost. This game makes me think, but it is a short, quick game. It looks beautiful. If you've ever seen pictures of Santorini, it's in Greece, right? Yeah. The game is produced as if it's that town with the white and the blue, and it is yeah. brilliant. Um this is actually located in your basic Target Walmart stores, which makes this highly accessible versus some other board games that we might play. Um, it's highly worth getting in that opinion, especially if you are in a home where two-player games get played a lot. I recommend this. This is, you know, again, it gives you that chess kind of abstract feel. And like that, like on a time, like, like other abstracts like chess, the object is very, very easy to understand. Yep. You, can, you can literally, in fact, my last... One of my last podcasts, I explained how to play the game in 20 seconds. Yeah, you're right. The God cards do kind of break the game. And so every time that you play with the God cards, you're playing with a completely different set of rules. I can't tell you how many times it's like, man, if I move up, this is going to work for him. And I'm like, I can't move up. Now i got to move sideways and try to block. or And so it changes the whole process. And there's a real thinking then. It's not that you don't think without the God power. Santorini is a great game without them. But with them, boy, you have to think. And, and this is this whole you're thinking two, three, four moves ahead to try to make sure that you are not just gaining for you to win, but preventing them from winning. So it, it really, love it. Uh, Santorini uh, would be my number seven. My number seven game is uh, Uno. No, my number seven game, I became a really big fan of gambling games after I first got in on a Kickstarter for one of their tiny epic line of games. We have a lot in the tiny epic line. Really enjoy tactics, have really enjoyed zombies, have loved quests. Go all the way back to Tiny Epic Kingdoms. But the the very first one that I kickstarted and fell in love with and found out after I got it how much of a thinking game this is, is Tiny Epic Western. My favorite Tiny Epic game. And I know a lot of people don't really care for this one because it is, it is a bit of a brain burner. This is a worker placement game that also has a three-card poker mechanic in it. And I think a lot of people get confused by that poker mechanic because it's... You're basically coming up with the best three-card hand as opposed to the best five-card hand. The suits are a little bit different, but it's got player aids in it. It gives you all the information that you need in order to be able to, to work the game. You've played this with me once. Yep. It was not probably the best time to play it because we were in the middle of a 24-hour run at uh, Geekway to the West. <clears throat> yeah. The box says 30 to 45 minutes. That's only true with people who already know how to play this game. If you're trying to teach people how to play this game at 4 in the morning, consider 15 to 20 minutes for the rules explanation. But man, it does a really great job of combining the Western theme with the mechanic very, very well. There's duels. You can fight other people when they when they decide they want to put their meeple on the same place that, that you're on. So you got these little big bullet dice that you roll for duels. And whoever wins the duel gets the wanted card thematically, which is really cool. But also, if you end up with the wanted card at the end of the game, you get an additional two bonus points. Trying to figure out the best place to go so that you can get the resources that you need to buy the properties that you want to buy so that you can get those victory points is the hard part. And that's one of the reasons I really do like this game, because you can really get bogged down in an in analysis paralysis on this one. But sometimes it's just fun to go and see what you can find, see what you can pull out. What what would what do you remember from playing? So, I, well, again, it, I liked the game. Um, I'm uh, a bit more towards Tiny Epic Tactics. Uh, that's the one that I specifically own and, and will play solo at times for my solo gaming. Um, if I had to choose, this would not be the one I picked. Sure. However, oh, yeah. um, 
I, I am the type of guy that loves poker, so therefore I was drawn to it because of that. Um, I'm a worker placement kind of guy, so therefore I like that. Um, I liked it. I need to play it when I'm not <laughs> 10, that tired. 10 a.m. And now I've played After it before. you just gotten up. Yeah. Any game I play the first time, if it's in an awkward scenario like that, <laughs> it's hard for me to give an opinion on. I've got several games in my life that I'm like, i got to play that again before I can really determine how much I like it. So yeah. uh, that's my opinion on it right now. I, I can't give a great one because I don't remember. <laughs> like four in the morning we've yeah. been playing for too long at that point so if you're looking for a game with a great western theme that plays in less than an hour i, I highly recommend checking it out tiny epic western my number seven number six by all accounts i probably shouldn't like this game because when i go to sit down at the table the last thing i want to do is math however <laughs> the first time i played power grid i fell in love with it it was it was it was it a game night it was at you know uh, the game night that, that we both attend, and it was a full five player game, and it was it was the deluxe. You know, the guy had the blinged out components and had the actual oil can oil barrels and everything else like that, and the radioactive stuff. Have you played this? I still haven't to this day. It's, it's one of those ones that I eventually want to sit down and yeah. have a game of to see what I think of it. Yeah, it's kind of area control, kind of not, but it's also an economic game, and that's one of the reasons why it surprises me. It it does make you think. It does make you count and think in numbers and you really have to be aware not only of what your budget is how much money you've got available but how much you can go on your turn how how many cities you can power at one time and do you want to go ahead and spend the money to power all the cities that you have power plants in or do you want to hold off on one so that you can power more on the next turn because the the end result of the game is not who has the most power plants it's who can power the most cities by the time you reach the end game condition. The last time I played this game, we ended up with a four-way tie, and the only reason I won was because I had more money available, more money in hand at the end of the game. One of the tiebreakers. That's the tiebreaker yeah. for the game. It's a really cool experience. If you don't like math, yeah, seriously, if you don't like math or you're not good at math, I wouldn't recommend this then game. Then this isn't for you. No, I'm kidding. No, I, honestly, I, I wouldn't recommend this game because you, you are thinking a lot. You're purchasing, you're buying, you're, you're auctioning. It's a really cool game, and there are tons of maps available for it. Um, I've only played the Germany, the German game, and the United States map. Man, what a good game. My number six is a co-op game. And uh, for a co-op game, there's a lot you can choose. The only problem with co-op games is you sometimes get people around the table that want to tell other people what to do. So this is always my concern with co-op games, right. where people tell other people, you should do this. Co-ops are not meant for one person <laughs> to run the game. Um, we've both played mm -hmm, in a game mm -hmm. together yep. where somebody told everybody what to do yep. and the game sucked. Yep. Even though we both love the game. Yep. No, never again. So I had to choose between two games. So I'm going to mention the one I didn't pick first, which is Forbidden Island. I like Forbidden Island. There's a lot of thought process that goes into that, but good it's game. almost, yeah, good game, but it's almost, you don't have to do a lot of thinking for this because frankly, the objective's there, you're going to go and do it. And it doesn't necessarily change much from hand to hand what you're doing. You, you can kind of see where you have to go a couple moves in advance. The one I chose is the one that most everybody knows that's been board gaming, and that's Pandemic. Now, I have played Pandemic Legacy Season 1, by the way. I have not played 2 or 0, the new one that's out. I'm not going to use that one because that's a whole different experience, oh, Pandemic man. Legacy Season 1. Yeah. In fact, frankly, that <laughs> might be overthinking a bit, so I don't... Those games can be a bit much, too. But Pandemic, I still play a lot. I also have Pandemic The Cure at home, which I like, but I find that Pandemic is the one that makes me think because... Based upon the power that you have from the character you're using, you need to make sure you're using that to your best ability to help everybody else on the board so on their moves, they what they do is easier. And you are fully maximizing that power. I have played Pandemic as a solo many times where I play several characters. It still, it still has that feeling of co-op to me that I really like. Yeah. And I've played games like Spirit Island and some of the other co-op games out there that people have talked about. Uh, Atlantis Rising and some others. I like all those games. But this was the one that fit in my uh, wheelhouse um, for this uh, because I still enjoy playing it these days because you are moving all across the board, taking advantage of powers and trying to think ahead, how do I stop this from exploding, this particular one of the four viruses, or if you have the expansions five, and it was a purple one, I think, with the expansions. Absolutely outstanding. The game still holds a good spot, oh, yeah. even though it's mass marketed these days. It's out there a lot. Um, I still enjoy it. Still own it. How uh, many versions of Pandemic are there? Uh, I actually just watched, uh, not to shout out uh, to Z Garcia with Dice Tower, I actually watched him ranking his favorite yes. Pandemic games and watched his one where he ranked his favorite Pandemic characters with all the different characters. <laughs> Love watching that stuff. And there's like 
14 regular characters you can get with the expansions. Oh, wow. So I wow. there's more than 10. There's maybe 15 pandemics by now. Wow. And each has its own theme and it's doing different well, things. Pandemic. Yep. There's Rising pandemic, Tide, Fall of Rome. Cure, Rising Tide, Fall of Rome, Cthulhu, Cthulhu Reign of Cthulhu, yep. uh, uh, Iberia. Yep. You've got the three legacy games. Rapid Response. Yep, Rapid legacy, Response. Season 1, Season 2, Season 0. Pandemic the Cure. Yeah. A large number of them out now. Um, oh, you find Contagion. It, Contagion. Which is a different type of game. Yeah, but yeah. still, they, they've got, and I haven't played all of them. Pandemic still gets played. We pull it out from time to time, play it at the house. And, and I, I, there's enough thinking in that. It get, I'm thinking a couple moves in advance. Discussing it with the other players, asking them what they want to do, that's, letting them do their thing. That's the thing about Pandemic that I think sets it set the standard for cooperative games. I mean, that it was the first co-op. It's one of the few cooperative games that where I really feel like you are actually working cooperatively. It, it forces you to think not what can I do, but how can I help the team. It really forces you to think that way. Yeah. Not every cooperative game does that. Yeah. If your power allows you to move somebody else's piece during your turn. Boy, that's great because then you can say, all right, look, I'm moving you here so you can get what you need to get done on your turn. It really makes you think and work together, which, by the way, is another huge, awesome thing for those in recovery is working together with other people. It, it, it's a highly recommend Pandemic for that. So. Yeah, not not putting the focus all on yourself and what you can do. But, yeah, yep. that really – that. That takes a shift in, in, in thinking, and I think that's a good yeah. good, good choice for that. Yeah. So that's uh, Pandemic is my number six, my co-op version. Number five. All right, my number five, I picked a set collection. Now, the caveat for my set collection for this, <laughs> caveat, is that this game is one of the hardest to read because the, oh. all the words on it are small. You're going to have to pass stuff around. You're going to have to look at these little cards, and, and the big cards on the board are hard to read. It's the negative of the game. Otherwise, it's a beautiful game, plays great, and that is Ex Libris. The fantasy theme of being a librarian trying to put together the best bookshelf is really unique. It's Ikea the game. Set collection. You're, you're picking cards, and every card has several books on it, and every book has a unique name to it, which is really kind of funny. You can laugh through it. But also because then you have to alphabetize them because you get more points if they're alphabetized. In fact, if you get out of order, you can lose points. Love you, my wife. <laughs> Analysis paralysis for this game is really easy if you're not great at alphabetizing. I'm just telling you right up in advance, if you're one of those people that had a hard time going to the old bookshelves at the libraries when you have to actually pull out the card shelves and find the letters you were looking for. If you find yourself going A, B, C, D, E, F, Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I love the game because like you're playing a character with a unique power, too. Yeah. And so that gives you an advantage that nobody else has. It actually doesn't break the game. These are not breaking game powers, but it gives you one advantage that no one else has. True. Sometimes you can go somewhere to move somebody off a space. Um, sometimes you can duplicate someone else's move. Basically, at the end, you're scoring points based upon having the most of your own favored, the most of the game favored, because there's five different brands of books. And then there's one that's, they're called banned books. And you have to avoid having banned books right. too. So there's ones you're trying yeah. not to put in your collection. There's a real thought process that I goes on in this. that. Yeah. Again, analysis paralysis can happen for some people. So it's a warning in this one. But for me, I like the thinking process because I'm usually in advance. And, and by the way, part of this is every round different powers go out on the board or different ways to get cards. We played this together at Geekway one year. I think it so. Was, yeah. It was a play and win game. We played it together at Geekway to the West one year. And it's it, he's, he's not wrong. It's a good looking game. It's yeah. a beautiful looking game. Yeah, they did well. Um, we own it. We won't get rid of it every year when I do my yearly purge. It's one of the first ones that, that, that gets put back on the shelf because uh, my wife and I both enjoy playing it. So Life imitating art. That was my number five, Ex Libra, set collection. And number five, I didn't think I was going to have two party games on this list. But this one is unique because it is a party game. It is a lot of fun. Uh, it was kickstarted, and then after it was successful to kickstart it, it was picked up for distribution by Mattel, of all places. And that's how I found out that I could get it for like less than $10. And that is... Fun Employed. You said it was a lot of fun, by the way. Fun it is employed. Fun Employed. It is this fantastic game. Now, this is a Impress the Judge game. So, with that caveat, it's a little bit different than the, your typical Impress the Judge game. What are some of the press, Impress the Judge games they know? Apple Something to Apple. like Apples to Apples, Cards Against Humanity, Super Fights, stuff like yeah. that. The person who's the judge picks a type of job. And then you have a handful of resume cards. And these resume cards include objects or emotions, states of being, states of mental capacity or whatever, that you have to choose four of them and put those together to make a resume as to why you are the best person for that particular job. Yeah. It 
forces you to think in a particular direction with very limited resources. And that's one of the things I like about it. It, it totally reminds me of when I was working improv comedy, getting suggestions from the crowd, and then we would have to try to make something funny from those suggestions. And this is a game that's all about making people making people have fun and making people laugh. It almost doesn't really matter who wins. Yeah. But it does make you think in that particular direction. Okay, how can I use a bicycle, a vat of acid, and an apple to tell somebody that I would be a great airline pilot. See, this I think this fits perfectly into the role for you because you how much you like role playing. Yeah. And and for you with the role playing, you get to somewhat role play because you're using the words you've given to give the explanation of why you're using them. Um, yeah. I was trying to think in yeah, my you head. Get, you get to give justification for your Right. Your and choices. and um, the whole idea behind that then is is you're explaining it. You can take any word and if you are good at that process, oh, balderdash. I'm going to throw Balderdash out for this because this is exactly that, <laughs> yeah. but in a different mode. Because the laughter that can come from this is when somebody is all of a sudden explaining the vat of acid. It's like, how's that going to fit? And then you hear their explanation and you will you will laugh when you right. play this because of that, much like with some of the definitions in Balderdash. So yeah. that's why I was thinking Balderdash for this. It fits yeah. very well with that. Yeah. But it, it, really does, it really does force you to open up your creativity. So it's very different from the analytical side of things. Yep. If you're used to being very analytical and, and you're thinking this this forces you to kind of go the other direction. <laughs> Sometimes somebody will end up with four cards that perfectly explain. Right. Any sane person would hire you based on those criteria. But and, and realize that in this type of game, if you are the type of person who likes the ingenuity and the uh, the role playing and, and, and the, the improv, sometimes this game is not always going to get you a win. Right. <laughs> Even if you have the best answer, because someone's going to crack you up with the worst answer ever. And because it's a judge-based game, someone's right. going to go, oh, no, I'm picking yeah. yours because you made me laugh. So understand these types of games have to yeah. be taken that way. You've got to go into them light and know I may not always get my vote, the vote. This is this is one of those games where the object is simply to play it. Yep. It, it doesn't really matter if you win or lose. So yep. that's my number five, Fun Employed. Number four. And number four, I was really, really pleasantly surprised by this one because it when I saw it, at first, it, it didn't really seem like a game that would interest me. I don't really have too much of an interest in games that have historical roots, which makes me wonder why I own a couple. <laughs> but I do. And uh, Emotep, Builders of Egypt. Oh, wow. My number four. It's a lot more than I expected. You're, what you're doing is you're taking big, big pieces of stone and you're loading them onto ships and then once the ships have a minimum number number of stones on them you can use one of your turns to send the ships over to a specific area the stones are then unloaded in a particular order and you can earn points based on how they're unloaded whether you're building an obelisk whether you're uh, building the mummy's tomb you can also go to a place where you can get additional cards that could give you points based on a variety of different conditions in the game have you played this one i have not it, another one i have not gotten a chance to get to the table it's a great it's a great game that i think that you could play with with your family it doesn't require you know a, a ton of overanalyzing once you start playing you see all the different things that you can do and do I want to spend my turn to put another one of my stones on one of these sleds over here? Or do I want to spend my turn to take this sled that's got somebody else's stones over and take it over to a location where I know they're not going to want their stones? It's it's a it's a bit of take that. It's a bit of trying to assess what the best route is. And every game is different because you, you never know what somebody else is going to do at the table. You want to try and get points out there, but you also want to try and keep people from getting the best points that they can. It's a really good balance of nice. a game. You know, the neat part when we talk about these games, when we have or haven't played them, is like, oh, what are we going to do on our next game? Night? Right. <laughs> Maybe these are going to hit the table. So. Hey. Bring Emotep. Hey, bring Emotep. Need bring to play Emotep. that. My number four is my social deduction group game. Now, please understand when I say group, there's a difference between large group and group. I consider group game to be a game that probably plays up to eight, but probably plays more than four. So I got to know, what have you played with more than eight people? I'm going to have to think. Oh, well, you know, some of the larger group party games. Jeez, nasty. Like catchphrase. Nasty, yeah, like that. catchphrase, nasty things. Uh, I haven't played Cards Against Humanity and have no real desire to, though my son loves it. Apples to apples, I've played with a large group before. You know, whatever. So, <laughs> excuse me. For my social deduction group game is Deception, Murder, in Hong Kong. Nice. Um, now, I have played this with more than eight before, but 
Um, this ends up being one that gets played a lot with my family. We would get together once a month and have a family game night. And this was one of two games that has hit the table many times. Uh, Deception Murder Hong Kong is social deduction because you have someone that's the murderer, someone that's the accomplishment. Accomplishment. It's an accomplishment. They murdered someone. Someone's we did it. Yay. Yay. I killed them. <laughs> He's dead. Dope. Um, so murderer, accomplice, and uh, witness. And these three are hidden roles because the witness needs to stay hidden from the murderer and the accomplice. And the murder accomplice has to stay hidden from everybody else. There's one person at the table that is trying. They are the uh, lead detective, the uh, scient- what, lead scientist. They have the information. They know who did it and what they did, but they don't have. They've got to get other people to find that out. So their job is to put the information on the table, and everybody has to determine from that based on clues in front of every person what the murder weapon is and what the clue left behind is. If you are doing it right as the murderer, the two items you pick that you use to murder and what you left behind as the clue will match other people's things at the board and nobody else knows. So that way when people start saying something, you are misdirecting. This more than a lot of the other social deduction games really makes you think. And I will say that there are some social deduction games that make me overthink. So Chronicles of Crime, it makes me overthink because I'm missing something every time I play. I like it. Some of the unlock and exit games, same thing. I can be stuck Dumped out of my mind. That's overthinking for me. But this game's not overthinking because you can usually break it down to two or three players who are probably the person, and you're usually within one or two of the clues or weapons. And so it's it, you're not like all over the place going, I don't know what I'm missing. You're literally looking, going, I'm almost positive you did it, but I can't tell which weapon it was. And you have to get that right. Love this game. It plays well with the the light gamers. The non gamers will play it, and it is. I've never played this in a situation where we haven't had a good time. I've, I've only played this a couple times, and and uh, both times were with you, and each time we played it the 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 possible items that we were looking for got narrowed down pretty quickly yeah so it doesn't take much to say oh, well that's not possible that's not possible but that is possible and it's really if you're playing with eight people it's not a matter of narrowing down one from eight it's narrowing down one from three it's a really smart really smart design it's a great game i think it plays best with the six seven eight player number but the numbers are important i think and i think that five to eight number works well i have played four games in a row of this before and gotten them done in less than an hour my number four social deduction game deception murder in hong kong number three number three my number three is a hand management area control that I always have a hard time explaining. I have played this game four times. I've always played it with my gaming group and don't own this on Monday nights, and that is Concordia. Never played this one. I love this game, and it, but yet it's a game I'll probably never own because it'll never play at my home. Okay. You have a, a deck of cards that you can build on and add to as the game goes on, and you're using those cards to do certain actions that move your boats or people across land or water, and you're trying to build at each of these places and get resources at each of these places as you're doing this. Um, there are also cards that if somebody else plays something at the table, you can play your card to play their card. So it allows you to double up on something that you've only got one card in your hand. But if you play the right card, you can play theirs. Very um, nice. That's cool. The cards add to the end game points. And it looks more complicated than it is. It's one of those ones in my mind. It sounds more complicated than I think it is. Every time I go to play it, I'm always like, oh, i got to remember the rules. And I'll get like one, two hands into it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, I love this game. I love this game. And I don't overthink with this. It's close to overthinking with me, but I don't overthink with it because I now have played it enough that I'm kind of in advance saying to myself, i got to get there. That's important. I know everyone's going for that. I'm going to go there. And I'm the type of person that I usually try to be two or three moves in advance. So when my turn comes around, I play quick so the next person can go. Probably why I don't win a lot of the games because I don't. I probably need to think more sometimes. But for me, it's the enjoyment of the game more than it is the final score. That's my number three, Concordia. If you can lose a game and still have a great time playing it, that's a great yeah. game. Yeah, error control, hand management, Concordia, my number three. My number three, I, I told you earlier that I didn't have a deck builder on my list, but I was wrong. I forgot that I have a deck builder on my <laughs> list. And the reason I forgot is because this is not like a lot of deck builders that are out there for one very specific reason. This is Eon's End. And yes, in case you're wondering, that is the correct way to pronounce it. No one was wondering. No one was wondering. Aeon? Yeah. I looked it up. Okay, I, I looked it up, guys. Anyway, Eon's End is a fantastic fantasy-based deck-building game where you are trying to defeat one centralized monster or enemy. It's a great cooperative deck-building game. It's unique in that when you play, you you really need to play your cards in a specific order. You discard your cards in your discard pile, and when you're done with your turn, you do not shuffle the discard pile when you go to turn it back over and and, it back and refresh your deck. You also have the option to keep certain cards in your hand 
at the end of your turn instead of discarding everything. You don't have to discard everything. No. And that, I think, plays into the strategy. It's a little bit more strategic than a typical deck builder like Clank would be or, or like Star Realms or something like that. Right. You have breaches that have to be either focused or opened before you can basically prep a spell. And what, that's what you're doing. You're basically using spells to cast damage against these enemies and against the minions that they control. But the very first time I played this was at Geekway to the West. We played with a, a group of four people, and we ended up winning the game. But it was one of those things where we knew we were within two turns of losing. Not one of the deck builders I've played, so I don't have experience with this. You and I have talked a lot about right. this before, and probably one of those ones where we need to get to the table and I need to play it because I, I think yeah. I'd enjoy it. I, I Again, we play a lot of deck builders at my house. It, it, I've found that it is one of my wife's favorite genres of games to play. So, um, yeah, and it's fantasy-related, and I'm, I'm a big D&D &D yeah. guy from my past, so I'm sure it would fit within my realm. Plus, there's there's so many um, so many versions of the game, and there's a, there's a legacy version of the game. And from what I understand, the legacy version is fantastic. It's one of the better legacy nice. games out there. So, nice. Eons End, my number three. Number two. Number two is probably one of the one of the most fun themes of all the games on my list. When I found out about the theme and I found out about this particular game and how you you can plant peppers and you can harvest peppers and you actually have a board where you plant these pepper shaped wooden things into the board, Scoville got onto my radar in a big way. And the first year I went to Geekway to the West, uh, Tasty Minstrel Games had a booth set up there, and they had it on sale for $40, and I snagged a copy. No questions asked. Played the game for the first time with four other people. I don't think I ended up winning, but man, that cemented it for me. What a cool, what a cool game. You're combining several different mechanics here. You've got auction mechanics. You've got uh, worker movement. You've got resource management. And what else? Well, set collection. Because, set collection. Yeah, Thank you. because you are trying to build, get the chilies. You have to have certain peppers for yeah. those. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to join in on this. It's not on my list, not because it's not a game that makes me think. For me, sometimes because of the movement part with the farmer, you would think there's a lot of thinking in that. But I play a lot of it at three, and at three, you don't always, after the second turn, you're not blocking each other anymore. There's so much open space. That is true. The more players true. you play, yes. there's a lot of thinking going on because you have to think about how do I get around this person to get the peppers I want. And and so understand that at two and three, frankly, in my opinion, it's not a huge think. It's it's... It goes pretty fast. At five and six, and you and I have played a six-player game Oh, my game gosh, before. that six-player. Okay, so there's the other <laughs> end of it. So I'm going to tell you, play it at three, four, and five, because I'm going to tell you that that six-player game took forever. You were waiting for your turn. two hours. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It felt it like forever, but maybe. <laughs> I felt like, like I'm waiting for my turn. Is it my turn yet? Maybe it was the location and the time and everything else because we were right by where everyone was walking by, and True. I think loads of conversations took place. Yeah. This was a geek way. Yeah. And I, I look, I love the game. I don't don't get me wrong, but you know, we always have one experience we can walk away from. And as fun as it is, six for me was too much. Yeah. Three to five is is the niche in my opinion for this game. Yeah, it, so. it's it's it, you play up to six people. You can. I found a solo version of the game that you can play. It's it's when you're combining two different colors to come up with another color. That's where the thinking part comes in. So there is there is absolutely there is there is a, the trap of analysis paralysis in this particular game if you're not careful. And Man, mostly in the planting and movement. What like a, the planting and movement really can get like again my wife whom yeah. I love um, analysis paralysis any game. But in this one, that's where it happens. She's yeah. thinking about where do I go? What am I going to get? And then she'll yeah. look at the board and look up and look at the board and look up and I'll be like, just move. But it's it's a very very relatable theme. I think anybody can latch onto this theme. Yep. The theme blends with the mechanics almost seamlessly. Yep. The bidding leads to um, turn order selection, yep. so you can choose what order that you'd like to go ahead and go in. You know, kind of like with Power Grid, you have things go in one particular order at one phase of the round, and then another order at another phase of the round. That's exactly the same thing that happens in this game. You can set yourself, if, you, if you've got the resources to do it, you can set yourself up to have some really good turns, or to just bide your time and wait. But man, what a good... You own the expansion with this, right? Yes, I haven't played... You haven't played it. I haven't played the expansion with other people. I have played it solo. Okay. But Scoville Labs, the expansion, gives you a lot more... Gives you a lot more options. We've not played with the expansion yet, but we've talked about it. That one of these days we've either got to borrow from you or yeah. buy it um, because we like the game so much. It gets played quite often in my house. It's yeah. a it's a favorite. I think it's it's so bright on the table that you, so it, cool. you know the, yeah the, the production of this they game. did a good job. They did a really really good job with the production of it. I think yeah. the game value um, lends itself to the medium gamer, but I think that even the heavy gamers will play it, and that's that's always nice for a game when you're part of some of the board gaming groups. Yeah, is that it's. 
It's got just enough to it that you're really thinking through it. But you can pull some of the heavy gamers in and they would play a game like that and they'd be okay with it. The theme wouldn't attract the heavy gamers, but the gameplay of it is kind of heavy. Got, yeah, it's got just enough to it that it would at least... They interact with it and play with it through, yeah. and you know, yeah. So, yep. Yeah, I just love the way it looks at the table. Scott Capel did a fantastic job with the artwork, yeah. and for those of you that don't aren't familiar, Scott Capel is also one of the people behind Kids Table Board Games, who also published another game that we enjoy, which is Problem Picnic. If you're looking for something that looks really cool at the table, especially if you have younger kids, I would check out Kids Table Board Gamers. But for this list, my number two, Scoville. These two are easy if anybody knows me. These two are my number one and two on my list. I think I know what they are. I had to think through this to make sure these actually fit here on this list. No, you didn't. Well, <laughs> here's the thing. I love these games so much that even if I didn't think a lot, I'd still, I'd still love them. But I wouldn't put them on this list unless I really think there's a thought process. Now, my number two fits into my passive Dungeons & Dragons. Now, I've mentioned... The role player world because of cartographers, but this one is actually role player. Yeah. Now I'm going to explain two two things about this that you need to know about role player. It's a dice placement game where you're building a character. However, the two expansions, Monsters and Minions, and now the Fiends and Familiars that have come out. Excellent job. In fact, I've always argued that though uh, role player would be a top 25 or 50 game for me by itself, it is my number two favorite game because of Monsters and Minions. As I've played now Fiends and Familiars and own Fiends and Familiars several times now, I can tell you that it seamlessly fit into it in such a way that though it's not essential, I would argue why play without it because it doesn't really change the game in a way that's going to hamper down the ability to teach somebody. I can teach someone as quickly and easily how to play with the new expansion as I can without it. So you might as well play with it because it adds more to the game. Now you aren't just building a character. You're also fighting monsters. That was what Monsters and Minions did. And Fiends and Familiars added some different dice. Familiars that you start with gives you more game space to place dice. Fiends, which can actually deter your ability oh, wow. to get your points for the dice. So it's giving a positive and a negative to the game that you have to really think through your choices of how you use these cards. There's a, there's a set collection aspect to this dice placement. Um, you can get weapons and spells and, and, and stuff to enhance your character. But the whole idea is to get dice fitting in a certain realm for this. If you are... The type of person that was into Dungeons and Dragons or role-playing games where we had to create a character. This game is essential in my opinion because you can take someone that was big into role-playing and bring them into board gaming that are into those mm -hmm. type of role-playing yeah. games where they create characters. They just recently came out with the expansion. I didn't get it because the, the cost was too much for me and I'm not as much into the role-playing in my family. Um, they came out with uh, Role Player Adventures, which is a role-playing oh, game. Yeah. And you can use your characters from this in that world. And from, it looks brilliant. It looks like they did a great job. I just couldn't get into it. I have a, a weird history with this game because the first time I played it was with you and it was with the Monsters and Minions expansion. The Monsters and Minions almost makes role player a complete experience. Yeah. The core game by itself is great. It's fine. It's kind of like putting together a puzzle, you know, and I like puzzles. I actually won a copy of Role Player through an online contest yep. and I traded it for Dungeon Pets. That's right. Which is a game I almost put on this list. That's right. Because it's... Which it's I haven't a, played yet. It's a fairly heavy game, but again, it's one of those games where the theme and the mechanics blend in pretty seamlessly. The reason I went with that particular game over role players is because role player kind of made me think too much. Oh. <laughs> you know? I got to the point where I was I was having... It triggered my AP. It triggered my analysis paralysis. I have a one, a one, and a two. What do I do with that? You know, that type right. of thing. What do so, I think? I will tell you this about role player, and I've experienced this with a good friend of mine who's a part of our Monday Night group, uh, you know, Britt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Britt likes this game very much and has played it with me several times. And Britt tried to apologize after he and I played it together because of how much time he took on his last <laughs> turns. <laughs> Because he was really thinking about the best implica what dice he could take, use, and place. Yeah. Um, and and I said to him, I said, now actually this game does lead to the last round specifically, or the last couple rounds, where you really are thinking, because this is where if you are the type of player that wants the most points, you are really thinking about yeah. where you place them at the end. As, Early, as the options narrow down. Oh my have, gosh, yeah. yeah. And so I get that, and I don't have any problem with that part <laughs> right. in the last couple rounds. I have a problem with people on their first or second dice pool are staring. <laughs> I'm like, there's ways what to move dice as the game goes on. Well, and that's get it down. That's kind of what was happening to me. Yeah. <laughs> I would play this solo all the time. At first roll, I'm like, 
oh crap, I don't know where I want to put this tie. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've learned that that you know this, there are certain different strategies. Sometimes you get lucky and you're blessed with good rolls early on, which right. makes it easy. Sometimes yeah. you have a mess, and so you'll give up a category. And since you're filling in six categories, of your character strength, wisdom, intelligence, you might say, fine, this guy's going to be the dumbest rock, or whatever. So I'm giving him no points in intelligence. That type of stuff you can kind of get going early on, so it doesn't get into analysis paralysis. But yeah. when you have this middling number where you're rolling instead of ones and sixes, you're rolling the threes, fours, and fives. Now you're all confused because you don't know what to do. So sometimes right. the dice can lead to that. Well, I think I think that kind of helps the challenge. Sure. Really. And I, I let myself go down that dark path. <laughs> what type of character do you want? Here Again, I don't yeah, want to make true. this too long. That's true. Is if you're really into building a character that has its own personality and you know that you are this type of character and, and, and this type of race and, and you have this trait and then you're kind of like, okay... He can be a dumb wizard. So I'm going to, you know, just, and people are like, what? And you're like, nah, because this fits with who he is. Right. So sometimes it's not about the points. It's just about creating this really unique character that you kind of walk away going, wow, I created this. And I've seen some people yeah. do that where, like, I'm trying to make this kind of character today. <laughs> yeah. And okay, then you know what you're doing. And so. that really depends on how you want to play the game. Because yeah. I, I was always trying to play to get the highest score that I could. Yeah. I wasn't necessarily going for the character building. I have another game that I enjoy that deals with character building that doesn't doesn't use that mechanic at all. But it's all about it's all about all well, focuses on the type of character that you want. Right. I didn't play it that particular way, and that's probably one of the reasons I got stuck in the you know the AP side of things. Sure, it's a great game. Yeah, I it's, love it. It's my favorite number two there, game. Of there's all time. a reason. Yeah. There's a reason it's sold out very very quickly. Every in time. first three printings. Yep. The challenge of trying to kind of perfect what this character is supposed to be really right. makes me think, but because I love it, I don't feel like I'm overthinking ever with it because it's kind of, you know, I think how would this character play in D&D since I did years right. of D&D. It's you, like, wow, that guy could play that way. That'd be kind of cool. So You've got the potential for what this, even without role player adventures, you've got the potential for what this character could be long after you finish your yeah. game. Yeah, and I keep track of some. There are some I've kept because I've been like, that's a cool character. I want to hang on to that. So my number two is role player. All right, so I'm going to give you my number one now. So I, we're not going to do a drum roll because the table shakes. Uh, for those that know me, they know what my number one game is. Um, I went through a phase for this game last year in guess. 2019 where I wouldn't teach anybody new this game. I love this game, <laughs> but this game takes forever to teach. Yeah. So the thinking I love for this is the gameplay, not the setup, and not the actual teaching of it. So please understand, I will teach people again. I had to take a year off from it. Uh, we were at Geekway <laughs> two years ago. Oh, gosh. You, I played taught, like four times, and every game had at least one player that had never played before, and I had to teach the game. And I got to tell you, I don't mind teaching people this game. I love this game. But when I did it that much that often, that when that year was over, I made, I made, that was my kind of yearly thing. It's like, I will not, if someone wants to play this, already played it, absolutely put it down, I'll play. And I did several times that year. I love A Feast for Odin. For those of you that don't know me, I am a, uh, a medium weight game player. That's what I love. I love to play heavy games, but they don't usually fall within the bracket of my favorite games. It's just not my style. Feast for Odin, in my opinion, is right at the top of the medium range bracket of games, okay? And the reason is because <laughs> some people overthink this game and think because there's 60 choices that you can make when you're making your moves that there's too much to think. Yes. So if in this case, I'm I'm a woodcrafter, so I'm going to do everything I can to go to the forest to get wood and use wood to produce items and use those items. And there's this is Tetris. Uwe Rosenberg is all about Tetris, mm -hmm. okay? So this is really about utilizing worker placement, to get resources, which either feed your people at the end of every round, you have to feed your people, going to an island, to Tetris an island, or your own personal board. The only interaction with other people in this game is that when you take a space, somebody else can't. I've played this with you. Yes. You're not um, the biggest fan of this game. Well, here's the thing. I like games that take... when you, It's a table hog, by the way. When I tell you my number one game, you're going to slap me because I'm going to sound like a hypocrite. I don't necessarily want to sit down and play a worker placement game for two hours. You know, when you and I played, it didn't quite take two hours. You know, no. the explanation took about 20 minutes and then the gameplay took and about And the setup takes about 20, 30 minutes. I mean, yeah. it, it's it's not a game to put to the table and think an hour later you're done. Even with everyone's played before, it's not going to happen. But it's a good game. I was able to grok it pretty quickly. I won the game that you taught me. Yep. And to me, one of the marks of a really good game is in the design, if you can explain it to somebody and they win the first time they've ever played the game, yep. that's to me, that's the mark of a good game. Don't get me wrong. It's a good game. It's a <laughs> very good game. It's not the type of game that I would normally like to play. However, 
my experience in playing it was just like there are so many options. Let's see what I want to go for. And it, and it was that it was that kind of at a two player level. It was kind of cool to have that many options to be able to go. This will work. This will work. This will work. Two things. One is I think it has one of the better solo options of a lot of games out there because the way the solo option with it works is that you play two colors as if you're playing two players. Okay. One round you'll play, let's say yellow. And you leave them on the board for the second round. Oh, so your nice. second round, you're doing it again, but you can't go where you were the last round. So therefore, you can't double up on a move. Um, the second thing I always tell people is this. Look, it's not that there may not be a better move from any move you make, but there's no real wrong move in this yeah. game. Yeah. You can yeah. do anything and you're going to get something. And even if that may not utilize excess points by the end of the game, and you may at the end of the game go, wow, I could have done this better... The key is, as you pick a journey, you're going to go down. So my wife loves to breed animals. And so she'll end up with a pile of pigs and <laughs> and, and, and uh, horses and cows and sheep, which are the four main animals. Um, She's hungry. Yeah, and she'll have a pile of them. And every one of them is worth so many points at the end of the game. And you can make up for what's not on the board by doing other things. I've played this game in two years 40 times. I don't know what the number is. I'll have to go back and look. It's quite a bit. I've played this a lot. But every time I play, I play something different. I go, I'm going to try this today. Oh, here's what my starting card is. All right, I'm going to try for this. Let's see what happens. I'm, I'm looking at the, the entry on Board Game Geek. It's it's 8.2, ranked number 22 overall. For the most part, deserved. 16 in strategy games. It's got a weight of 3.83 as voted on by the community. I think that might be a little high. I think that might probably might be closer to 3.4, 3.3. Sure. Because it, it makes sense. Once you start playing the game, I, I think the heaviness factor probably had to do with how much the box actually weighs. But it's also age 12 and up. I have know? both expansions, by the way, and I can't fit it all in the box. <laughs> yes. I have a rubber band wrapped around a sheet, and this thing is this big. It, it, it weighs as much as the Feast for Odin. I, There's really a lot to like about this game. I, it may not be my favorite, and I may not want to spend two hours, two and a half hours, sitting down to play it, but I would. I just played, a couple, sat- I just played a couple Saturdays ago with a couple of guys, a three-player game. We had a blast with it. Um, with any game, I always find things out I don't know from the last time I played. You know, someone says, oh, no, you can do this this way. And I go, no, you don't. I've played this 30 times. I've never played that way. And they'll go re- look through the rules and go, oh, <laughs> didn't know that. <laughs> Interesting. Anyway, so. Read the rules right, ladies and gentlemen. Read the rules. Saying. Read the rules. Think. Watch a, watch a video on how to play the game and make sure that you, you cross-reference it with the rules. My number one. It's my favorite game of all time. It does definitely make me think, but it's not an overthinking. And that's a feast for Odin. Yeah. And I can see why this would be number one on this list. I've got four games that I consider, that I've played, that I consider to be great experience type games. Games where you spend a significant amount of time at the table playing them. These are games that are a little bit different and they they are a little bit more narrative driven. Pandemic Legacy was one of them. Dead of Winter is another one. Battlestar Galactica was another one. I knew it was going to be mentioned at least because it's... uh... It's the experience. He really game. loves it, and it's a great experience game. I yeah. like the game. The biggest thinking that you have to do in Battlestar Galactica is the deduction. Yeah. Who's a Cylon? And you find out pretty definitively who is and who isn't. Yeah. There's one experience game that I've played only one time. From both angles, I can see how this could be a really difficult game to find out what you're looking for as quickly as you possibly can. And that's Fury of Dracula. I was so impressed by this, this the experience of playing this game because this can take up to three hours to play. I think the one time I played it, it took us about two, two and a half. You got it's a hidden movement game, so you've got one player playing Dracula. All the other players are playing four different hunters. The hunters are searching for Dracula all throughout Europe. On the hunters' side, you have to try and deduce where Dracula could be based on what you're going to find out as you play. On Dracula's side, you're going to try and figure out where to go based on where the hunters are going. You're trying to predict which direction they could go. The game that we played, I played Dracula, and I got discovered pretty quickly, like by Tuesday. <laughs> they found me, and I was like, oh, crap. So then I had to, to find a way to flee and, and get out of there and try to map my way around to another area where I couldn't be found. It's an interesting game in that the goal for the players is to try and find and then defeat Dracula. But there's a big difference between finding Dracula 
and fighting him enough to defeat him. It really requires a good balance. Once the first person finds Dracula, then everybody really needs to try converge on the area where Dracula is going to be after that. For Dracula, the idea is to try and avoid as much as you can. Do you go on the water, knowing that water being on water is going to cause damage to you every turn? Or do you try to stick to the land, knowing that you can't travel as fast or as far as the hunters can because Dracula is a very old man and he's afraid of trains to borrow a joke from shut up and sit down but it's such a cool experience and I've always loved the Dracula mythos I've always liked vampires and stuff and this one really turns your head in different directions depending on what you're playing when people think of games that make you stretch your mind this isn't necessarily one that first comes to the to the top but man this this one does really yeah, another one I need to play, and that's what the question I asked was. Yeah. So um, I've played Jaws twice. Okay. Jaws, a newer release. And there's two parts to Jaws. The first part is exactly that. The it is the movement. It's the hidden movement. The one person is playing Jaws, and the other up to three players are playing the three characters as in the movie. Right. It's actually done very, very well. Very impressed with how this game was done. The feel of that is, is you're like, okay... All it takes is one nibble, you know, on something or one hit on something. And now you're like, I know he's in this area. Right. So that's why I'm asking your question. Have you played Jaws yet? I haven't. I really would like to because I've heard some great things about it. It plays well. So I was asking it to relate yeah. it because... You know what? It's, it's actually kind of similar to Fury of Dracula because one of the things that Dracula does is that he's got a he's got a trail of six spaces that where he, he leaves the location cards face down. Um, but any time one of the trails goes past the sixth place, it matures... And there's an encounter card on top of that that matures and can cause bad things to happen. The longer you go in the game, and the longer it takes for the hunters to find Dracula, the higher the despair goes. And when the despair goes higher, then Dracula's influence can become greater and greater. And if Dracula's influence can become great enough, the hunters lose the game. The The last time that we hosted a game night at our church, I really wanted to get this one to the table. <laughs> so much so that I actually got it out and set it up. Nobody wanted, no, to play wanted to play that night. Other no, stuff hit the table. Well, you they, know, maybe. they wanted to play Dead of Winter instead. And I was like, all right, well, let's play Dead of Winter. Yeah, yeah. Probably Which is another really good game. It's so. okay. I'll put it away. I'll put it away. I'll bring it back up. For another time. This one may come back out at our next yeah. game night then. So. Yeah. I, I honestly didn't never thought that I would like this game. I really didn't. But, man, there's a reason they've come out with a third and fourth edition. Most it, people that talk about this actually talk about yeah. really enjoying the game. It gets it, good reviews from the people we watch. Yeah. that do gaming reviews. And if you're looking for a game experience that will last two to three hours at the table, this is a great one. There's games like this, Eldritch Horror, uh, Dead of Winter, Battlestar Galactus, stuff like that. Stuff that can last two to three hours per play, they're well worth it. So that's uh, those are our top ten yep. games. Uh, top ten games that stretch your mind, that make you think. Yeah, in uh, a good way. Make you think in a good way. Make you fill your mind. In my case, my thought process is, fun you're enjoying it you're into it you're thinking through it and it's it, you know 30 minutes to two hours worth of getting your head off other yeah. things unplug from everything else that's going on in the world and, and just concentrate on one other thing for a while uh we're gonna put these lists in the comments so check out the uh the show the show notes now for our show stopping check out, number check out the description below for the full <laughs> ranking of these swear to god <laughs> Check out the description in the, uh, the video description below. Uh, if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe, hit the notification bell. I really appreciate you guys watching. Thank you guys so much. Jason, I want to thank you for being on the Oh, I love this. Great. Thanks for having me on. No problem. No problem. If you would like to see a top 10 list of other unique items that you haven't seen in a top 10 list video before, go ahead and leave a comment. Or if you'd like to leave a comment with your favorite game that makes you stretch your mind, it makes you think in different ways. Let us know. I'll uh, keep this conversation going. I'm also asking you to check out my Patreon, Backburner Games. Patreon.com slash Backburner Games. I design uh, role-playing game content for role-playing gamers. And this is designed to get people to the table very, very easily. Low barrier of entry, rules light type stuff. And hopefully it's something that everybody can relate to. So check it out on Patreon.com slash Backburner Games. This is Zach W. Lorton with the Backburner Podcast saying thank you so much. Have a good one. This podcast copyright back Bruno Productions 2020. All rights reserved, Callahan. Oh yeah? What about the rights of that little girl? All games, titles, images, video, and music featured in this podcast are the property of the copyright owners and not the creator of this podcast. 
Get original tabletop RPG content every month by supporting Backburner Games on Patreon at patreon.com slash Backburner Games. You wanna love us, 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 you wanna, love us, you wanna now. Not bad. Mm-hmm. Hour and a half, and there'll be stuff you yelled at it out of that. Now, that actually didn't go too bad. That's going to be a long episode, buddy. That's all we right. we both talked quite we a bit. We did. We did. That's all right, though. I mean, we were we were loquacious on this one. Yeah, we were.